Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. As part of a comprehensive general analysis, today we'll be discussing five important articles out of the Hindu newspaper, Delhi edition. Before we begin, some important announcements. We are now available on Telegram, so do subscribe to us on Telegram via the QR code given here or the link given in the description below. Further, we have episode 87 of International Relations this week. Don't miss this session and subscribe to our YouTube channel to get all notifications. With this, let's begin our analysis for today, which is NASA's DART spacecraft and the DART program in that regard, a significant milestone in our space technology and space history itself because DART, which is an acronym for Double Asteroid Redirection Test, spacecraft actually collided with a space rock or an asteroid called Diomorphos. Diomorphos and Didymos are actually two asteroids which together form a system. Didymos is the larger rock around which the Diomorphos rock or asteroid is revolving around. The concept was very simple, which is we wanted to shift Diomorphos's orbit a little bit closer via this collision and we have been able to do that. So the DART spacecraft collided with the space rock called Diomorphos and if we talk about the sizes and the basic designs, NASA has confirmed that the collision of the auto rickshaw size 600 kilogram weighing DART, which is a spacecraft itself, to the football stadium size Diomorphos, about 5 billion kilograms in mass was actually done and this deflected the trajectory of the pair of space rocks. This is very very important. What is the concept? The concept is very simple, very important for GS paper 3 page number 10 of the newspaper. The concept is very simple where Didymos is the larger rock around which Diomorphos is revolving around and we wanted to see if we collide with a certain object does the angular momentum change and does the orbit change itself. So the DART aircraft with its small CubeSat which was then relaying all the images and the basic data of the DART spacecraft. It collided with the Diomorphos and therefore it changed its course and was able to shift the orbit inwards. And this is linked to the larger existential crisis which we have with regards to asteroids and how asteroids, meteoroids or meteors can actually lead to some form of extinction level event in the world itself. So the momentum of DART crashing at the breakneck speed of 23,760 kilometers per hour was adequate to slash the angular momentum of Diomorphos, making it speed up and move closer to Didymos. And if we see the whole array, there is the DART aircraft, which was going to hit the Diomorphos asteroid itself. And you had the small cube set, which was equipped with cameras, relaying all the images back to Earth. Over and above that, Didymos is a much, much bigger rock, close to 780 meters wide. Diomorphos is 160 meters, which is smaller. And this was only an auto rickshaw sized spacecraft. Therefore, when you look at the sizes, it was a major event because just using a small object such as the DART spacecraft, we were able to shift the angular momentum. And the basic concept behind this mission, the aim is to protect Earth from a killer asteroid. Asteroids, as we know, are residual products of the formation of the solar system itself. And more than that, what it is believed is that when asteroids enter into our atmosphere, most of them burn. But if they don't burn, they do reach as meteors on the ground itself. And if a right sized meteor lands into the Earth, it could lead to major catastrophic events. So it is believed if they are large enough, a charred piece falling through as a meteorite, the falling piece from a meteorite 140 meters wide or more will be capable of completely wiping out the city of Chennai. And if it is more than one or two kilometers, it could have a devastating impact. And we already have an event, which is a standpoint for what happens when asteroids hit the Earth, wherein about 66 million years ago, an asteroid about 10 to 15 kilometers struck the Earth. The tsunami, volcanic eruptions, and the thick dust clouds therefore actually decimated the dinosaurs and 75% of all species on the earth were extinct via this event itself. So when we talk about DART, DART was a very simple mission, but a very important mission with regards to our existential crisis, with regards to our extinction itself. It is believed that because asteroids are part of the larger solar system, we have a whole belt and from time to time they do cross path with earth's orbit. We need to make sure that big 
asteroids don't enter the atmosphere thereby leading to devastating disasters in the earth's surface itself therefore the dart spacecraft is extremely significant in the larger story of our space technology because now we are using a kick method so as to change the course of certain kinds of asteroids and certain kinds of rocks which are there in the space however this is not the only agenda the first agenda is very simple to make sure that earth is not hit with a killer asteroid in that regard however the hidden agenda here is space mining it is believed that if we have the right technology and if one can tug a mineral rich asteroid near the moon or establish a space mining factory between the orbits of the earth and mars it could then allow us access to precious minerals which are needed for the development of the earth itself and these minerals technically we call them rare earth metals for example yttrium niobium rhodium palladium osmium iridium and scandium basic point is what we believe is that if we can push them out of their orbit we can also pull them into certain orbits so the kick technique that deflects asteroids can be used to move a small asteroid into a convenient position for space mining the topic is very simple but very very significant before we move on to the second topic i want to revise which is that what is this concept dart becomes important for prelims itself because they can ask you what is the dart spacecraft related to second you need to remember the asteroid names didymos and diomorphos third what is the first purpose the first purpose is to make sure that all asteroids which pose an existential crisis to earth are somehow removed from their orbit so as to make sure that they don't collide with earth we already know what happened to the dinosaurs therefore asteroids are a very major existential threat to the earth itself therefore the first aim is making sure that no killer asteroid enters our atmosphere itself second is the commercial aspect which is space mining this is the larger picture in this technology which is that rare earth metals are very very important for a sustainable future for renewable energy therefore space mining could be the future of using the asteroids because they all have the basic rare earth metals which are needed for renewable energy resources on earth itself so we don't have to complicate it too much remember the basic point is shifting orbits and dart was able to do that angular momentum was increased it did change its course it is a major breakthrough because it's a stepping stone to something bigger and we believe that we can now use this to tug and pull china is also going to do something exactly the same in 2024 therefore this is now becoming a trend wherein we are trying to make sure that asteroids don't become a threat to human existence with this let's move to the second topic which is equally interesting which is the labor bureau's aqee survey what does aqee actually stand for all india quarterly established based employment survey aqees and labor bureau's aqees has become very very significant because it has given us a new indicator of how post covid recovery is happening at this point of time so the survey which was released by the union labor minister has estimated around 3.18 crore workers were employed in five tech establishments between january and march further what is more significant is that there's an increase of about 4 lakh workers compared to the third round of the qes the quarterly employment survey which was done in the last three months of 2021 so it's very significant for your paper 3 the basic point is this is giving us employment data. data employment was an important aspect related to covid-19 and the pandemic itself unemployment increased quite a lot and this data is telling us where are the increases in employment opportunities what is the basic trend and more than that this data is showing us that there's a recovery when it comes to how employment opportunities are now rising after the covid-19 pandemic itself so if you look at the basic data from the first to the fourth quarter there has been a steady increase in the number of workforce more than that from 3.14 crore we have now reached to 3.18 crore so the labor bureau always does the aqees survey to provide quarterly estimates about employment and related variables of establishment in both organized and unorganized segments and this is uh, the important static part of this topic and the sectors which it looks after is nine 
which is manufacturing, construction, trade, transportation, education, health, accommodation, restaurant, IT, BPO and financial services. So basically this survey looks into these nine sectors and sees the basic trend in employment. And what we are actually witnessing is that education, manufacturing, trade and financial services together account for 84% of total estimated units or total estimated employment. More than that, Manufacturing sector accounts for the largest percentage 38.5% of the total number of workers followed by education 21.7 and IT BPO 12% and health sector 10.6%. Though you don't have to learn the basic data what you can learn is the highest and the lowest and the general trend itself. These are trend based questions which come in economics beat the prelims of the mains examination becomes important for your preparation generally. So the participation of women workers witnessed a marginal increase from 316 percent to 31.8 percent between the third and the fourth quarter so this data is very encouraging that we are seeing a recovery in employment however what is more encouraging is the women's related data wherein women workers constituted about 52 percent of the workforce in the healthcare sector while in the education finance and it bpo sector 44 41 and 36 percent so what we are seeing is that there is a revival in the employment data but women's performance in this data is equally encouraging it is even more noteworthy to know that when it comes to self-employed persons women's outnumber the males when it comes to self-employed financial services and the survey was also able to tell us that 86.4 percent of the workers were regular employees 8.7 percent were contractual employees followed by casual workforce which is 2.3 percent and self-employed 2 percent so the important concept here is that total employment in these nine selected sectors have collectively increased from 2.37 crore which was in 2013-2014 and now it has reached to 3.18 crore. Before we go on to the next topic again I want to summarize the basic point here. The basic point here is that you don't have to learn the data what you have to learn is the basic trend what we are seeing is that there's an increase of 4 lakh workers and within the same quarter we are seeing women performing better between the first and the fourth quarter what we have seen is that there is an increase of 10 lakh workers itself and this is the sign of recovery the basic point is 2022 is the january february march quarter is seeing a lot of rise in employment which is very very encouraging so before we move on to the third topic which is india and nepal what have we done till this point we first understood the concept of dart dart being used to change the course of asteroids in order to stop a killer asteroid hitting the earth and for space mining purposes second this topic again small but extremely significant wherein we have the aqes survey which was done by the labor bureau which tells us the basic point that there is an encouraging trend in employment and the trend is that it is going up steadily not exponentially and from q1 and q4 in 2021-2022 we are seeing a 10 lakh increase in the workforce further in the q4 itself the last quarter itself we saw 4 lakh new workers the manufacturing education and the it bpo sector are the three best performing sectors itself service based economy in that regard but manufacturing also performing very very well in that regard and at the end of the day women's performance in these three sectors itself is very very encouraging with health sector having 52 percent of the workforce as women now you don't use this data what you use is trends mains examination or prelims examination UPSC will never ask you for raw data they're going to ask you trends so remember that there is an upward trend in employment after the COVID-19 pandemic and that has now been revealed via the AQEES survey now let's move on to the third topic which is energizing India Nepal ties we already know that India and Nepal are facing a little bit of tensions with regards to its relationship with India China Nepal China and India Nepal itself this trilogy of relations is seeing stresses because China is trying to use the Belt and Road Initiative to use Nepal as a counter to India itself however we have got a new opportunity this time and through Heidel power we can make sure that our relationship we can use a soft power to make a relationship with Nepal better so the investment board of Nepal signed a memorandum of understanding with India's 
National Hydroelectric Power Corporation NHPC and it is now on the West Sethi and the Sethi River projects which is close to 1200 megawatts. The Sethi River is very important and the Sethi River project previously actually was with China and now after the withdrawal of Chinese contracts, we have been given the contract in Nepal itself. So nearly four years have passed since China withdrew from this project and Nepal has finally decided to give it to India. So the author tries to argue that this is a golden opportunity to make a relationship with Nepal better. The project was actually first given to the Australians, then it was taken up by the Chinese and now we have the opportunity to develop this project. So first let's try to understand where this river is. The Sethi river itself is a very important lifeline of the western part of Nepal at this point of time and a hydroelectric power plant is very very important because Nepal faces a lot of shortages when it comes to electricity in its peak season. It imports a lot of electricity from India itself. However, in the off season it exports electricity to India. So there's a major import and export of electricity via the Nepal sector itself. This project could be beneficial for both India and Nepal because this could meet the demand in the summer season and over and above that we can also get the surplus supply when our electricity is also peaking at the highest. Therefore, the decision to involve India is a sign that Nepal is reposing its faith in India to complete this project. If completed, it is expected to provide India the much needed leverage in future hydro power cooperation. More than that, because China was initially involved in this and Ch India now getting involved, it is a way in which we see a shift in Nepal's understanding. It. India is already involved in a lot of different hydro power projects in Nepal itself. For example, the Mahakali Treaty, the Upper Karnali project, the Arun 3 project in Western and Eastern Nepal sector respectively. And this project is extremely significant because it will allow India to minimize the geopolitical influence of China and confirm its presence in Nepal. Considering that the West Sethi hydroelectric power project was one of the major Chinese ventures under the Belt and Road Initiative. So under the Belt and Road Initiative, it was a major push in Nepal that we are developing the West Sethi project itself with one belt, one road project itself going into a little bit of limbo and China losing interest in Nepal. It is an extremely important opportunity for India to seize Nepal's cooperation via soft power. So the potentiality of this project is very simple. Since investment related constraints have delayed the project, there's a need to carefully develop and study all investment scenarios, particularly a conducive environment for redistribution, transmission, distribution networks, cost of resettlement, rehabilitation because it's a dam. More than that, India also has an opportunity to use this to bring other regional partners under BBIN, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, BBIN framework to develop more cooperation in the power sector. So this Editorial was extremely significant for our preparation because it gives us three major understandings. First, what has happened in Nepal with regards to this project with the Chinese have now withdrawn and Nepal finally has added to give it to India. Second, this is a major opportunity for India to use its soft power as a technological power to make sure that Nepal can pivot towards India itself. And there have been tensions within this trilogy of India, Nepal and China. More than that, third, which is more important is India can now use hydroelectric power, electricity and power as a major form of cooperation in the BBIN project itself and in this whole sector itself. India needs to keep all its neighbors very close to its heart. Therefore, we need to use these opportunities to make sure that Nepal is pivoting towards India itself. So we've done the first three topics, DART, second related to the AQES report and now India Nepal and all three are talking about three different aspects. First, space technology, science and technology, very, very important. Second, with regards to the concept of employment and the pandemic. And third, we have now understood how the SETI project, though we have to see how it develops further because $2 billion is needed as investment. This project, how it goes forward is going to be the future of India-Nepal relationships. And we have to make sure because there have been strains, a lot of sanctions, a lot of different tension points and irritants between the relationship of India and Nepal. And we have now got the golden opportunity to use this project. With this, let's enter the fourth topic, which is the UNSC permanent seat. 
India has been always pitted as a candidate for becoming a permanent member of the UN Security Council. The UN reforms are overdue in that regard. But when it comes to the permanent seat itself and the concept of veto power, it is a complicated issue. And this editorial actually talks about how it's easier to now become a nuclear power than to actually become a permanent power or the P5 in the UN itself. So it talks about India's candidature as a permanent member, which is not denied by anybody generally except for China and Pakistan. But it talks about the modalities and the obstacles. How do we get it? Should we get it? How should we get it? And what should be our compromise? What is the basic program which India can follow to get it? And the problem, the obstacle here are actually much more interesting than the candidature itself. So there is considerable unhappiness among the members of the UN with regards to the right to veto. And basically, the changing of the membership of the council, which is that any change in the UNSC and the UN itself requires amending the charter. And this involves the consent of two thirds of the total members of the UN, including the votes of the P5. Therefore, the veto comes into consideration. So if we have to become a permanent member, we need to have all five together. And if anybody is going to veto, it is going to become a problem. Now, this article is more interesting, not because of the modalities. We know that India has always been a good candidate for a P5 member. It has always been a good candidate for a security council seat, a permanent membership there. But what is more interesting is how everything else is changing and blocking that the obstacles. So the four declared candidates, we which everybody agrees to, which is called the G4, India, Japan, Brazil and Germany are seen as future permanent members of the UNSC. However, the problem is that this still does not fit into the concept that each and every continent needs to be represented in the UNSC, the Security Council and Africa, Latin America and the Caribbeans are still unrepresented categories in the UNSC. The problem in this story is that Africa's claim for the two permanent seats have wide understanding and support. However, Africans still have to decide which two countries would be their candidate. Further, though India is accepted by everybody as a very good candidate, Pakistan will oppose and China will never support this, either India's candidature or Japan's candidature. But what is even more interesting is how Italy is invoking the Second World War rhetoric. So Brazil had its regional opponents with regards to Paraguay and Argentina. But for Germany, Italy is firmly opposing to its claim. And Italy has a very interesting argument for this. What they argue is if Germany and Japan both axis powers of the Second World War, the most aggressive ones in that regard, the aggressors. Hence, the enemy states were to join as the permanent members. Then why would you leave out Italy only? Then you give Italy also a seat in the UN Security Council. If aggressor states such as Germany, who are the most important protagonists in the Second World War, are allowed to enter the P5, the Security Council as permanent members with veto, then why are you leaving Italy out? So the basic point is, though the G4 itself is very, very strong and saying that, yes, we want to be the next permanent members with veto powers in the UN Security Council. What is even more interesting is how each and every country has an opposition. Africa has no consensus who would be their leader. Latin America, same issue. With regards to Brazil, we already see Argentina talking about it. China will never support India and Japan. Further, Italy is saying that if you are allowing Japan and Germany to become a member, then why are you leaving us? Though Italy is not a superpower, it's not a very strong power when it comes to its economy. So basic point is Italy is saying that if you're allowing all enemy states, enemy under the charter, because the charter was produced just after the Second World War, if you're allowing them to become members, why not Italy also? So basically, it's a mess. It's a mess. And this is what the article is trying to tell us that basically there's a major problematic aspect to UN Security Council reform because there is too much opposition to each and every candidate. And in that context, what the article suggests is that even if India enjoyed near universal support, there would be no way that India alone would be elected. It will have to package a deal 
involving other countries from other groups also and there's a very long standing debate whether the aspiring countries should accept permanent membership without the right to veto now this is even more interesting what the writer is saying is that there's a major push for saying that you become permanent members but we will not give you veto now here in comes the compromise so new category of semi permanent members should be created this is the way forward however countries would be elected for a period of 8 to 10 years and would be eligible for re-election india ought to give serious consideration to this idea that maybe the way forward is this which is to be a permanent member without veto and some experts are of the opinion that india should not accept permanent membership without veto and this is what the article leaves at and this is what the article tries to talk about and i am talking to you about this because in mains and unsc reform being a very important topic it's given us a new and interesting perspective the new and interesting perspective is that should we just go for permanent membership without veto or should we make sure that veto is something which we have to stick with now when we talk about permanent membership without veto there would be more support for that however what is the point of being a permanent member without veto powers so unsc reform as the article says is a very very hard road very difficult road and with too much opposition so we know that for every candidature in the g4 who argue to be the next successors or the next permanent members of the un security council there is opposition for all of them china will always block everything for this reform to happen veto should not be used by any of the p5 powers and china is there for that so this article gives you a question it gives you something to think about and that is that does india need to figure out a compromise and if that compromise is about taking permanent membership without veto is it worth it if not how long can we just be a non permanent member with the way the whole un security council works right now maybe we can go for a long term semi permanent membership with some form of rights however this is the biggest issue unsc reforms is in the hands of the p5 members and basically p5 will never do something to weaken their own position including china us and britain therefore this is to something to ponder about and i will leave you at this question that what do we do with this and it's totally your call as the future ifs officers of india what should be india's approach because it's not easy and this is why we are doing this topic because this is a type of question which can easily be asked in mains that with regards to the current geopolitical landscape what should be india's approach in the long so with this now let's enter our last topic which is an app called jaldoot interesting because of prelims they can easily ask you this basic question with regards to jaldoot with the rapidly decreasing water table which is now even threatening india's national security and food security with regards to droughts and major extreme weather events the union government has now launched a new mobile application called jaldoot jointly developed by the ministry of rural development and panchayati raj ministry remember the two ministries can come in the exam this is going to give us basic indicators with regards to water levels in different parts of india and what we can see from the basic data is the top 3 major states where the percentage water level in wells increased between the may 1st to 31st period and october 1st to 31st period basically they are what they're doing is they're measuring they are using the app to capture the water levels at 2 to 3 open wells in every village twice a year once in may and once in october and then trying to figure out what is the difference between the two and tamil nadu karnataka telangana are showing a change percentage change in a good level which is 86% above 80% so between may and october after the monsoon there is an 86% increase in the water in the water table on the other hand the three worst performing states in that regard and it is not a coincidence punjab rajasthan and haryana with 50 to 60% increase only and more usage in the rabi season itself means that there is a need to track this basic understanding that between the monsoon season before and after is the ground level fluctuating too much so to ensure transparency the officers assigned for the task have to geotag the photographs of the wells through the app to ensure that the measurement was actually done and 
the mobile app will work in the online offline mode to ensure that internet connectivity does not become a problem in the remote areas itself so before we go to the main question let's try to summarize everything what we done today the first topic we discussed today was the dart program of nasa very simply the topic was related to how we can change the course of asteroids and their orbits and it was a small demonstrator program the first aim is to make sure that killer asteroids don't enter into the earth's orbit or hit the earth itself and further second is to make sure that space mining could be done in a future date though we need a lot of development in that regard but rare earth metals which are needed for renewable energy in india can be found in these asteroids so therefore this is the rudimentary first step in that direction second topic which we discussed was the aqees report of of the labor bureau this is an extremely significant report because it talks about recovery in the employment sector after the pandemic in that regard because we have so much data available to us now we can now see that yes in employment also we are seeing a rise and between the first and the fourth quarter there was a major increase of 10 lakh people employed in certain sectors more than that manufacturing education and the it bpo sector is performing quite well women are also becoming a part of the workforce significantly via the healthcare sector then we moved on to the india nepal story the seti hydroelectric power project how it is a new opportunity for india to make its ties better with nepal and then we talked about unsc reform how unsc reform is quite a difficult task and if india has to become a member it has to find a package in which other countries are also going forward but then comes the italian argument or even the chinese and the pakistani opposition and should we accept unsc seat without veto or with veto and in the end we've just completed our discussion with regards to cna with the jaldoot app it becomes important because for prelims they can easily ask you a very simple question what is it related to remember the two ministries which were involved and over and above that it is a significant task which we need to do which is to see how is the water table going up and down india has a major shortage in fresh water access to water is going to become a major disaster and hazard later therefore we need to track it also now let's just look at the mains questions question number 1 nasa's dart program has the potentiality to avert the extinction of human kind on earth elucidate very easy topic you need to talk about the first disaster which happened on earth with regards to the dinosaurs 66 million years ago and how there can be a potential threat via asteroids to earth and you can talk about the chennai example also and then move to the dart program how it has done something via shifting the orbit of a smaller rock around a big asteroid thereby demonstrating to us that we can change the angular momentum thereby averting disasters second the labor bureau's aqee survey aqees means survey is indicative of post covid 19 economic recovery discuss here you need to talk about how we have we are seeing all the sectors rising how our growth is going up how our gdp is going up and that is also being corresponded by the aqee survey which is telling us that there's an increase in employment steadily since the last quarter in 2021 to the latest quarter in 2022 and there are certain trends which are very very encouraging with this i would like to end the session thank you so much for your patience i will see you in the next cna take care